Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Collaborative Science for Estuaries webinar series. This monthly event features projects supported by the Near Science Collaborative Program, and my name is Jen Reed. I work with the Science Collaborative team here at the University of Michigan. I'm going to be moderating our webinar today. We're excited to be debuting a new webinar format today that features five panelists who are going to be discussing Living Shorelines research and its application. Um, before we meet our panelists, however, I want to provide you just a little bit more background on the program. So the National Estuarine Research Reserve System, or NEARS, is a network of 29 unique research reserves in estuaries across the country, as you can see on this map. This is a federal state partnership program that's managed by NOAA, and it works in collaboration with state entities, typically a state agency or a university, and in some cases, a nonprofit, which are local place-based partners located in or near the particular estuaries that the reserves are part of. Each reserve site includes programs that focus on stewardship, research, and ecosystem monitoring, training programs for local officials, and education, kind of K through gray. The Near Science Collaborative is one of the research funding mechanisms for the reserve system. The research it supports is highly collaborative. It integrates end users into the research process itself in order to create products that support coastal management decision making. So just a little bit more about today. Um, this webinar, if you've tuned into our um, previous webinars, is a little bit different than the other ones we've had. Um, those have primarily focused on individual projects. Today, though, we want to share what's being learned about living shorelines across several projects at different reserves in the system. So we've invited reserve staff and researchers who are working closely with the NEARS to identify and meet the information and practical needs of landowners, regulators, and contractors as they relate to living shorelines. Their work addresses questions about maybe placement, design, long-term performance. Um, and they've also been developing tools, such as guidance for site assessment and post-installation monitoring or evaluation. The panel discussion today will inform a Living Shorelines management brief, a draft of which we circulated ahead of the webinar, and you should have seen links to be able to access that. We're intending to update that brief based on today's discussion and then redistribute it later this month. So if you haven't seen it yet, you'll get a chance to see it. So here's what we're going to do today. Our panelists are going to be discussing, discussing lessons that they've learned on their projects, and then sort of how that has led to some identified next steps, maybe some opportunities and needs for living shoreline management and research. Our goal is to use both this discussion and the management brief to share uh, the lessons that have been learned across this body of living shorelines work and really to begin to articulate for the next management challenges and research questions that could be tackled in the reserve system. A couple of things about logistics here before we get underway or as we get underway. So due to the large audience that we have with us today, um, you are muted on entry and will stay muted throughout. Um, but we will be handling questions via um, the question feature on the GoToMeeting console, which you can see the blue arrow is directed to. If by chance your console is minimized, you have to press that sort of orange arrow to expand it. Um, we will have a Q&A portion at the end of the webinar, but as typically happens, you might have a question by the first speaker. Maybe you've got a question for me. Go ahead and type it in the question box, and um, we'll just be keeping track of those and answering them. We're uh, giving them to the appropriate um, panelists as we get to the Q&A session. So before we get started, we have a few questions for the audience. We want to get to know you a little bit in the sense of who's joining us today um, and get your perspective on living shorelines. So this poll will pop up, which is uh, wanting to know what kind of organization you work for please select all that apply. It could be a government entity, it could be a university or college, uh, it could be um, 
nonprofit organization, a for-profit organization, uh, or other. So I'll give you a minute here to complete the poll. About five more seconds for those of you who are um, just completing the pool. So thank you. This gives us a good sense of who we have uh, joining us today. About half of you work for a government agency at some level or other. Um, and then the rest look to be pretty well distributed across universities, nonprofits, and for-profit organizations with a couple of folks who are classified as other. So next, we want to get a sense of how familiar you are with the NIRS, the National Estuarine Research Reserve System. So you could select that you work for the NIRS, you partner with them, or maybe you rely on information from them, maybe you've heard about the NIRS, or you've never heard about them before, but you're interested in living shorelines. We'll give you about five more seconds here to finish filling the pool. So this is very interesting. About a third of you partner with the NIRS, um, and just under half have heard about the NIRS, which is great. Of course, everyone else in the other categories above know them very well. Some folks who work with the NIRS and some who rely on information. Interesting. Uh, 14% of you haven't heard about them before, so we're excited that uh, you're getting to learn about them today. Finally, as we wrap up the polls, the getting to know you polls here, we'd like to know a little bit more about your interest in living shorelines. So you could select from being someone who has helped implement a living shoreline project, or perhaps you're involved in research about living shorelines or you're generally interested in coastal management and outreach and possibly living shorelines are a good tool for you to use. Are uh, you just generally interested in coastal research or some other category? Okay, five more seconds here to finish up voting. And this is really interesting too, a little over half of you have either implemented a living shoreline project or are involved with research about living shorelines. Um, it's a nice group of folks who are just interested in coastal management outreach uh, or coastal research and interested in learning more about living shorelines. So we're excited to know a little bit more about you. And uh, I think it's time now to step into our activities here. So I'm going to start by inviting our panelists to do a round of self-introductions. I'm going to um, uh, ask them to spend maybe two minutes telling us a little bit about themselves, a personal perspective on how they became involved in this topic and then touch upon why it's a compelling management issue generally in their region. And Christine, I'm gonna invite you uh, to start off here. Sure, uh, so I'm Christine Angelini. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Florida, as you can see from the slide. And um, I'm in the early part of my academic career and I got involved in um, doing short, you know, sustainable shoreline research um, out of an, my eagerness to apply for um, a federal grant in my first year that was that was run through the NIRS Science Collaborative Program. And so 
I very carefully read the RFP that was um, that was posted, and it said, work on a topic that's of importance to managers in your area that can be sort of supported through the NIR system. And so I went to our local NIR, which is in Northeast Florida, and asked, so what is one of the key management issues that you're that you are facing. I'm trying to, you know, execute what this RFP is asking for, a request for proposal. And uh, very quickly, the issue of boats came up and their effect on driving the loss of marshes and oyster reefs in this part of Florida, and that that's likely a problem that's affecting uh, estuaries more broadly. Um, and as somebody who works a lot in coastal wetlands and um, hearing about the rates of loss, it became an issue that I really felt like I wanted to contribute to um, because the level of boating traffic is, is very high in my regions and, and in other places as well. So um, what was the second part of the question, Jen? I'm sorry. Uh, you've, you've addressed it actually because we want oh, okay. to get it Oh, right. so I'll, I'll pass the I'll pass the mic to, to the next person then. That's great. Thanks, Christine. You did a great job kicking us off here. So our next panelist, Stuart Finley. So Stuart, a little bit about how you got involved and why it's a compelling management issue where you are. Okay, thanks, Jen, and thanks to everyone for uh, participating this afternoon. Um, our Hudson River research has been going on for about 15 or 20 years, and the shoreline aspect was initially led by Dave Strayer, who's now retired but still very much engaged in the process. And it started off with uh, an interest sort of strictly from an academic science point of view, in that we knew an awful lot about the nearshore habitats of the Hudson, the marshes, the submerged vegetation, and it uh, became obvious to us that the part we were missing is that border transition to the uplines. So the, the shorelines of the Hudson are highly diverse. They've been modified by people for over 150 years. They're in various states of maintenance, uh, and obviously this is a place where the residents of the Hudson Valley come down to, to be with their river. And so from both an academic interest um, and sort of a filling the gap interest, we wanted to work on the Hudson, and we've worked closely with the um, Hudson River Reserve here for a long time. And their concerns, management concerns, deal with both the gradual rise in sea level and what, it, what is it going to do to these nearshore environments, um, as well as the possible uh, possibility of additional storms, which we know have very large and generally negative effects on these, these environments. So we've got a couple of links as to getting the project motivated. Um, and frankly, I, I think it's been a nice capstone for our, our past two decades of work. Great, thank you, Stuart. Um, next, I'm going to ask Jen Rollin to introduce herself. Uh, Jen is with us as a um, representing through the reserve management perspective. Um, so, slightly different prompt to you, Jen. Um, the significance of this topic to your reserve and your agency. Sure, sure. So, just um, logistically to let you let you all know the. Um, Chesapeake Bay National Estuary Research Reserve in Maryland is affiliated with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. We sit in the Chesapeake and Coastal Service, uh, which also happens to house our Coastal Zone Program, as well as our Habitat Restoration Group. And our Habitat Restoration Group are really um, the folks at the department that do, that implement a lot of living shorelines. So our involvement on the reserve system has been uh, on the coastal training side. We've worked on um, developing and delivering local trainings related to living shorelines. We also partnered in 2013 with Restore America's Estuaries to do at Mid-Atlantic Living Shoreline Summit. Um, and most recently, our um, reserve biologist is working um, with our department to develop the monitoring protocols for the state's resiliency through restoration program, which will fund um, additional living shorelines. I think it's, I need to be clear that I am not a living shorelines practitioner, um, but within my 11 years within the department, I've worked on the funding side. So I've funded lots of these types of projects and I'm um, you know, very aware of um, the, the funding cycle, get the money out the door, get the projects on the ground, so that you can go back and get more money. Um, but within my time with the reserve, I've really great, gained uh, an appreciation of the value of long-term monitoring. So my personal interest is kind of how to 
how to fit that all together, sort of the, the shorter time frames of where these funding pots go and the, and the value and the importance of really long-term monitoring. Um, within the state of Maryland, uh, we have some great um, tools in place to promote the implementation of living shorelines, but we certainly have um, a lot of the similar problems that other states have, which is really the awareness um, and, and getting uh, landowners to adopt this practice on their property. So I'm certainly interested in um, hearing from around uh, the country on some um, mechanisms for how we can overcome that barrier. Great, thank you, Jen, appreciate that. Um, next, I'm going to ask Nace Sanger to introduce herself. Remember, Nace, we're asking sort of how you got engaged in this research and sort of what it, how, how it's a, uh, an issue for your particular region. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Denise Sanger, and I am the Ace Basin NEAR Research Coordinator, and I'm also an ecologist with the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. The SCDNR has actually been implementing oyster-based restoration projects adjacent to uh, public land since the early 2000s. They weren't originally installed for erosion protection um, of the salt marsh, but it's become obvious they are reducing erosion um, as well as creating additional habitat. So the public has really become interested um, and seen this progress and, and has wanted to install similar living shoreline um, types of systems adjacent to their property. However, there are no specific regulations in South Carolina um, to allow living shorelines, and so it can result in a longer permitting time. Um, recognizing this, our state's Coastal Zone Management Agency, which is the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control Office of Ocean and Coastal Resource Management, or DHEC OCRM, they approached the Ace Basin, um, as well as DNR, about living shorelines and starting to work together to begin to evaluate them and develop guidelines specific to South Carolina. So that's how I became engaged in, in the importance to our state. Thank you, Denise. Uh, and I want to now ask Eric Sparks to introduce himself and tell us how he became involved in living shorelines. Hey, and thanks for... Uh... Thanks for having me. Um, again, my name is Eric Sparks. I'm an assistant extension professor for Mississippi State University. And then I have two roles at Mississippi Alabama Sea Grant Consortium, I'm the coastal ecology specialist and also the assistant director for outreach there. So um, uh, in, in graduate school, uh, I focused a lot of my research on shoreline restoration, um, specifically wetlands. And so that kind of just transitioned over into living shoreline research down the road and specifically for this science collaborative funded project. Um, we, we had a project team, not just me, but we, we collectively had a lot of discussions with uh, the reserve manager at the Weeks Bay National Estuary Research Reserve, LG Adams, about what needs they, they had for um, research that, that could be funded within that call. And one of the things that he mentioned was trying to determine whether they should plant or not behind this large breakwater complex that was installed um, on their on their property. And um, that just kind of led to questions of could, could you plant and not even have a breakwater there and, uh, and related type questions as well. So that, that's how we got involved with this specific project. And a lot of it was kind of spurred through pulse bill funding because there was a decent amount of money out there and living shorelines are being brought up at the same time. And so we wanted to get a good understanding on these large scale living shoreline projects, what the benefits we were getting back from them are. Yeah, thank you, Eric. So great, I wanna turn now to our discussion. Now that you've met the panelists, um, we had a few things we would like them to consider. Um, we have about half an hour, sort of till about quarter after for Eastern. I um, want to make sure we reserve time for questions. But the, the first thing I really just would like you to all kind of share succinctly so that you have an opportunity to sort of react to each other's um, comments and perspectives. But I'm going to ask um, Stuart to start with sharing sort of the most important lesson that you've learned through your research um, that you care to share with practitioners you think they should hear. Okay, thanks. Um, so a tiny little bit of background about our project. As I said in my introduction, we've been studying the Hudson and the various 
um, near shore environments habitats for a long time. And the specific thing that was funded by the Near Science Collaborative in the three year ago cycle um, was a protocol to do a rapid assessment of both the ecological function and physical function, the protective function uh, provided by um, the, the sort of living shorelines as we're calling them. And in order to develop that protocol, we needed to have a science base for what indicators might work um, to capture uh, these two types of functions, physical function and eco ecological function for a pretty broad array of um, shorelines that have been constructed um, to date. And so the fundamental science that went into this really came out of our previous 15 years of work where we looked at all kinds of shorelines along the Hudson, learned about you know, their value as fish habitat, learned about how well they accumulated organic matter, wave reflection issues such as that, and then we had to sort of fine tune this to bring it to applicability for these constructed shorelines, these, these living constructed um, shoreline types. And what we learned from that is that while the, the sort of fundamental understanding of what makes uh, an ecologically valuable shoreline, that, that basic knowledge has been around for quite a long time, and um, the, the attributes of shorelines that serve those functions well have been known for quite a long time. In a generic sense, we needed to determine um, how does that sort of scale down to, to, to these living shorelines that had been constructed. So just for example, it, it's, been clear, it's clear from almost any literature review that uh, very steep shorelines don't tend to have as much ecological value as gently sloping shorelines. And uh, the, the issue to nail down was what kind of range is really relevant for these living shorelines, and can we develop a method whereby the stewards for those shorelines would be able to go out and assess how their shoreline is doing, um, are different parts of it functioning differently, how is it holding up um, over time. So the, the sort of research challenge for us was to take the general knowledge and, and sort of get it fine-tuned or, or validated or calibrated for the local conditions um, and then make that very relevant for the people managing those shorelines and having cases sort of on the ground in their backyard also makes it easier for the regulators and the engineers that are proposing uh, shoreline modifications would view these living shorelines as part of their toolbox, would see these as viable, proven techniques that they could put forward to a client, that they could put forward to the regulatory community. So the big research angle um, that, that we had to get past was, you know, again, doing this calibration, uh, downscaling uh, kind of exercise, and that resulted in the protocol, which uh, just for clarity is now complete and is available on our website. And what's the lesson uh, that you would want to share with practitioners uh, coming from all that work? Because clearly there's a lot in there. Yeah, so, so the lesson is that um, if you're going to encourage this type of uh, shoreline modification treatment in, in other areas, I think you're going to run into the need to be able to show folks that, yes, this works. It will serve the, the protective function, whether it's simply minimizing erosion or protecting some infrastructure that's behind the shoreline. And you're gonna to need to show that it's uh, viable over years and uh, that the ecological benefits are there, but you're not giving up the physical uh, protective purposes of whatever the particular shoreline is you happen to be interested in. So it's all well and good to point to the literature showing these things work, uh, but to really get the, the local folks to buy in, you need to have some some places they can walk down to and touch uh, to make sure that, yes, these things really are um, a credible solution. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, Christine, I saw you nodding. Uh, would you pick up there, do you think, in, in your lesson that you, is your takeaway? Um, I guess so, yes. I think that the, the value is, you know, um, 
a picture is worth a thousand words or an experience of being out to one of these living shorelines is worth, you know, goes a, goes a long way in terms of convincing others that this is a, that this is a viable solution. Um, I guess my sort of lessons learned, I don't have the, the years and years of experience that Stuart does, um, but what I uh, sort of coming into sort of trying to, to do living shorelines in a, um, for the first time at, you know, in, in my career, um, I really learned the value of doing pilot scale uh, experiments and uh, trying things before going at larger scales uh, to see what sort of materials work well, uh, to see where you should be positioning things, you know, in the if you're in an inner title system relative to the title frame, um, and uh, before going sort of whole hog and and having a, a larger scale project sort of fleshed out. And so, um, just to you know, before to even get to Stuart's point of having um, a, a structure that you feel good is a, is one that will last a long t time and have a you know be worth a thousand words. Um, the first thing is to figure out how to what that shoreline is supposed to look like, what materials you're supposed to use, where that where its functionality is enhanced um, in terms of its, its actual you know where you put material in the environment. And um, we learned very well in our project. We had kind of budgeted in a pilot year, and we learned so much from that first year, and it saved us so much time over the longer time like scale in our in in, in running our project that. Um, I guess that's my sort of biggest take home for others is to to not feel like that within your project planning is to have build in time to test things out before you invest a lot in in uh, in the larger plan project scheme if if you have the flexibility to do so. Yeah, that's 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 great advice. Um, Denise, how about you? A different perspective, perhaps, or maybe picking up on that. Um, I would say our perspective is is very similar, and one of the things that that I think we learned um, was we did do a very experimental design of testing multiple treatment types from oyster based uh, methods to some natural fibers that really hadn't been tested in South Carolina. And so um, I echo Christine in in terms of you know really being able to test those things out across a variety of environments before um, you know they sort of become common practices uh, so that we really can understand, you know, what is are the expectations. Um, in our environments, uh, we tested the core logs, which are coconut fibers, and, you know, they don't work in some situations. Um, they work in other situations, and so really being able to help homeowners and, and folks that want to do this adjacent to their property understand what they could expect and what might work. Um, I think is very important. And also just, you know, as Stuart said, what do you expect over the long term from a maintenance perspective and um, even being able to sort of monitor your site to, to understand if it's actually um, successful uh, overall in, in what you hope to achieve. So I really think getting at the setting of expectations um, as well mm -hmm. as being able to test a, a whole series of different uh, materials becomes really important. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, Eric, I invite you to offer your lesson that you would think is the biggest takeaway from what you've been doing last two years here. Okay, so on the, the research that our project was evaluating large scale breakwaters, this, the, the one we started with in particular uh, was a little over half a kilometer long, so in reference to some no breakwater areas, and, and we were trying to get an idea of how uh, cost effective those those type of structures are um, in relation to some other practices that you could could do and what you could do to potentially enhance it. And um, the breakwater had been constructed um, four years prior to starting the monitoring here. So we kind of started off at year four and was just was rolling with our, our treatments and our, evalu our evaluation there. And um, we're, we had some areas where we planted uh, planted in some areas where we just marked off naturally colonized uh, Spartana in both breakwater and no breakwater areas. And uh, we're just now, it's about six, six and a half years after construction, seeing some differences between areas with breakwaters and areas without breakwaters. Um, so, and the, the major lesson there is when you're dealing with highly dynamic dynamic sites it's probably a good good idea to understand like the geologic history 
of the site. Um, our site was in particular on the eastern edge of Mobile Bay, which has been eroding for before before people were even really causing any issues there. So so knowing that going forward um, can kind of help you uh, put together your results and uh, maybe even help for design a future project there. And then on the the nine research side, this is more like discussions that we that we've had as far as the outreach component of this project and with our um, our advisory group, which we call our management application team. Um, we, we quickly realized that even if a property owner was interested in doing a living shoreline project in the area in uh, Mississippi and Alabama, it would be relatively um, difficult for them to run across a contractor that could that could do that work. Most of the time, if they're having shoreline erosion issues, they'll call out a contractor and more than likely that contractor installs bulkheads um, for a living. So they'll get more of the, the bulkhead side and not the living shoreline side. So training up a contractor base, uh, identifying where people can actually buy living shoreline materials and things like that at a local scale was kind of the lesson learned uh, so far from more of the discussion side of our project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are, those are both great insights. I want to ask Jen now, you said, you know, not a Living Shorelines practitioner, but boy, well, you've been a funder and as a reserve manager, what's your sort of reaction to what you're hearing here and, and sort of any insights and perspective and maybe lessons that you've garnered over the years? Oh, you're muted, Jen. <laughs> there, can you hear me now? Okay, good. Sorry. good. Um, from a reserve perspective, we like to, to say the research reserves are living laboratories and classrooms. So almost all the panelists here have said how important pilot projects are so that you can learn from them and you can showcase them. And to me, that sounds like a living laboratory and classroom. So I think the, um, the NEAR system is really poised to um, continue research in this because I think that um, you know, we have all the sectors, all the pieces together that can, can kind of address some of these issues. And if you're a reserve out there that, that is not uh, fully engaged in restoration, I wouldn't undersell the value of, of using our sites as reference sites and control sites. That's really important too. And that's something that's come up often as, as sort of there's, a, there's those, those lack of reference sites as well. Um, you know, I think the the network of the reserve system, we can certainly share some of our um, trainings. We've done trainings a long time ago before I, I was a manager for contractors. So I think there's there's opportunities from learns from the, the training side on how we kind of, you know, built up that um, the sort of the, the contractors that are available to, to do this. Um, from a non-reserve side, I, I talked to a lot of my uh, colleagues in preparation for this webinar, and they, they said the same thing. You just kind of have to try it, um, which I know is kind of a, a, a tall order, but um, y you have to, you know, get yourself a team of a willing landowner, whether it's, you know, public or private property, bring your regulatory agency in on day one, um, and really kind of explore that together, because once you get that small um, pilot project um, that tends to lead to more so yeah I mean it's it's pretty similar um, the designs might be different depending on the regions but the problems are the same yeah well you know your mention of bringing the, the regulatory side in and some of the other folks we might consider end users kind of draws us back to the fact that all of the other panelists here have been working closely on projects with potential users, people who are either going to be implementing or are implementing or thinking about regulatory issues, as Denise mentioned. I think you guys are all well positioned, really, to give us some comments and your thoughts on kind of what the next steps might be for management and research. We're kind of interested in, um, first of all, sort of thinking about the other panelists' lessons learned, how they resonate with you and what you found and then sort of how you think that might inform what's needed next. Um, does anyone want to volunteer to go? I mean, I'll go, I just spoke, but I'll go again. I have a laundry list. So I'll just pick yeah, one. Yeah, we'd love to do that. And then uh, they can react to them. Sure. Um, 
Sure. Um, and I mentioned this sort of in, in my intro. Um, you know, Maryland has some great tools in place to promote the implementation of Living Shorelines. We have um, the uh, Living Shorelines Act of 2008, which basically tells a property owner you have to prove to the state why you shouldn't put a living shoreline in. Um, we have some really um, great funding mechanisms. The department offers a zero interest loan program. So we, ha we have some great tools, but we have the same problems that everybody else has is those misconceptions of cost, uh, maintenance, and um, efficacy against the traditional uh, armored shorelines. Um, so I would love to see some social science uh, or, you know, more discussion on how other folks have really overcome those barriers to implementation because I think, I think they're, living to realize might make, make people nervous because they see, you know, a bulkhead or a riprap and it seems strong and it, it seems, you know, like a sure thing. Um, so, you know, really doing some great uh, cost benefit analysis. Um, if you can't get out to a site, Photo documentation is great. We have some really great photos from some um, previous living shorelines that survived some pretty significant storms, and that's really compelling. Um, so that communication piece, I think, is, is something that uh, we can all continue to work on. Yeah, those, those are uh, great sort of lists of sort of next steps. I'm curious to know, um, Denise, for example, the extent you've kind of run into some of the similar challenges uh, Jen mentioned. and you know, whether that's on your list of what the important next steps are for you and your group or sort of where you would take things? Um, so I think those will be next steps for us, but then we're not quite there yet um, because we just don't have the structure that Maryland has in terms of encouraging them. Um, and so I think once we get um, sort of the, the guidance document uh, developed that we're working on um, with the ECHO CRM, and then they try to actually develop uh, uh, regulations, um, I think that will then become very important as we move forward uh, to, you know, be able to express how these things work, um, that they are cost effective, you know, long term. Um, so we're not quite there yet um, and, you know, have to get through that, that first step um, that Maryland's already already been through. I think for us too, it's going to be from a research side, it's going to be continuing to test different things. So, you know, I'd really like to, the core logs um, can trap sediment very quickly, um, but, you know, don't have the long-term um, life that uh, or, uh, an actual bagged oyster shell reef does. And so might we be able to use them in combination such that we can trap the sediment um, get the oyster reef established, and then, you know, again, elongate the life um, of the the reef or, or the, the living shoreline. So I can see us, us moving towards that and um, from a research perspective, and then just getting it really established, um, the process to go through for uh, developing a living shoreline in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the idea of um, maybe providing a few more living shoreline tools, but then sort of seeing similar kinds of challenges that, that Jen's identified needing to be addressed in South Carolina as well, sounding like. Yeah. Well, how Correct. about up in, in New York in the Hudson River, Stuart? What's sort of your perspective up there? Do you find the next place living shorelines needs to go? Yeah, so one of the things we recognized early on is that the folks that actually propose the kind of treatment to be carried out of the site will be landscape architects, um, engineers, uh, to, to a large extent. So they were members of our advisory committee. And um, what they can say in the near term, again, is that they want to see these things on the ground and they want to see them functional and they want to see that, yes, we can demonstrate the ecological benefits. But I think in the longer term, it's going to require a change in practice. And from, from my point of view, sort of the, the perfect situation would be that when a client walks into someone's office and says, I own this, you know, quarter mile, and I think there's evidence of erosion, or I'm worried about, you know, the next storm is going to flood my swimming pool or, or, or whatever. What we'd like to see is that those engineers and consultants will have a list of options, and some of them may be the traditional hard options, and there are gonna be cases where that's probably the right thing to do, 
but I'd like to see the sort of uh, softer shorelines get uh, a fair place at the table. And the consultants would be able to speak knowledgeably and, and again, from a solid base of evidence that, yes, this is a viable solution for this particular case. Here's what it's going to cost. Here's how long it's going to last. Here are the pluses and minuses. Because right now, we're just not seeing those things getting uh, fair consideration at the, uh, the, the proposal stage. Uh, I know various states have various strengths of requirements about giving them consideration. But we just heard from Jen that, you know, even you can't regulate this from the top down. Uh, the best way to do it is to have the folks that are going to be doing the work telling the client, here are three options. And I think your best option in this case happens to be, you know, one of these, um, you know, living shorelines, more, more sustainable shorelines type of treatments. So I'm curious to know if you think it's a... Uh, sort of an information gap, a training gap, or a social science challenge? Or is it some combination thereof? I suspect it's, it's all the above. And someone before referred to the fact that we need to have a better sense of, you know, why do people pick a particular solution? Uh, simply because the engineer says this is it, and there's no questioning on the part of the client. Um, or they see their neighbor has one, and they, they like it, or they don't like it. Um, or they've learned something about them through, there's a, I mean, the Science Collaborative has done a great job in sort of putting out the results of these various projects. People run into that and say, oh, I want to I consider one of those. Um, so I, I think it's all of the above. There's, there's a change in practice for the, the consultants that are out there now. There's probably a change in the sort of educational material that they get as they go through school. And then we need a change in, in the, you know, what the clients are asking for. Great, thank you. Um, Christine, what's your perspective? Sort of where are things going next um, in Living Shoreline Woo? So I think there's, I don't know, two things in, from a research perspective that I, I think really need a lot more attention. And that's trying to enhance the ecological functionality of the shorelines that are already hardened and trying to engage homeowners that, you know, maybe they have a bulkhead and they put it up and but they don't want to walk away from the natural system that's next to them and um, and trying to expand. I think conceptually what we're thinking about leaving shorelines to not just be an eroding marsh um, and putting something in front of it that, that helps stabilize it, but to be a little bit more holistic in how we're thinking about sustainable shoreline solutions. And that, that includes enhancing the functionality of the green, the gray infrastructure as well. Um, so that's one thing where I think um, we should try to treat the, the built environment a little bit more harmonically with the, with the natural environment. And the other thing is, um, I think trying to, in examples where there's whole communities that are trying to buy in, is trying to quantify what the collective benefits are of, of softer solutions at a larger scale. Um, to start to motivate the need for that kind of collective action. Um, so there's communities in Florida where many of the people uh, in those communities are putting out oyster gardening sort of arrays and building living shorelines. And um, I think they could be trendsetters in terms of communities that are sort of at the leading edge of, um, of, of living better with nature. And um, for, from a research perspective, I think um, it'd be really interesting to quantify what the net benefits are and are they larger than you might expect from just an individual project because I think in general the living shorelines paradigm needs to go from something that's very piecemeal and opportunistic and a little bit scattered all over the place to something that we're thinking about this as a system that's that we're pushing towards having um, be a larger proportion of how we're managing shorelines and um, yeah, but that requires a perspective that has the whole system in mind. Um, so we need examples of where a systems approach, a whole community approach has made a difference or not, and, and therefore abandoned maybe that idea. Yeah, so almost thinking about sort of the ecosystem service aspect of it, which you really get at that sort of system level. Yeah. Eric, how about you? Um, sort of your final thoughts here on what or the sort of next place to go with living shorelines from your perspective? Yeah, um, so if you look at the ratio of 
public to a private owned property on coastlines. It's it's by far private. So we could living shoreline, uh, we could do living shoreline projects or protect shorelines on all of the publicly owned property and still kind of not even really put a dent in the total area. So I think we need to transition more into uh, private property um, scale evaluations and programs that address those folks. So in the extension service, we talk to a lot of property owners. And um, the, one of the first questions that we always hear is when we're talking, we're discussing like living shorelines versus hardened shorelines uh, project is, is like, oh, what, what assistance programs are there out there for, for these mm -hmm. type of approaches? Because it sounds like they're the best thing and normally think there's like, in, there's incentives for doing BMPs, especially in upland um, systems. So they're kind of looking for something similar here. So I think uh, developing some cost share programs, like, and I think local research that would inform that, such as what proportion of a uh, shoreline should be covered or what would be the most, um, not most appealing, 100% coverage would be most appealing, but kind of where's the sweet spot there and percentage um, allocation for a cost share type program. I know there's been um, one or two cost share programs for living shorelines, but um, I think we could mimic a lot of the upland BMP practices, um, such as long leaf pine plantation and putting in fire lanes and all that kind of work um, that happens in forested properties and kind of bring that down toward the shoreline a little bit, if so. So I think that's, I think that's kind of next on the, on the list, at least in my mind. Can I, mm -hmm. can I say that real quick? Sorry. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, just, just building off of what Eric's comments are, um, targeting homeowners associations or community groups is kind of a great way to sort of hit on Christine's point of, you know, we need to not look so piecemeal. So um, looking at the sort of the community level um, and getting more property owners involved uh, results in a larger project. It also drives costs down on an individual basis. So if there's more players in it, the cost goes down. Um, and then you can do some really innovative financing. I mean, if you go through a homeowners association or a watershed group or things like that, you can set up a special tax district for a loan, um, or you can, you know, if they are a five or one C3, it's a lot easier to get grants than it is if you're just like mm -hmm. one, one single entity that you might not be eligible. So um, that's kind of a, a savvy way and, and um, we haven't done a ton of it, um, but it's certainly um, sort of a group that, that we could um, collectively target in the future. Yeah, I mean, it, that speaks eloquently to the, you know, the role of outreach and engagement and the kinds of things that, you know, happen through extension and, and through the um, coastal training program. So I think there's sort of a lot of potential venues for this information that's being developed through these projects to really make a big difference. I think what we're curious about now is to hear from folks who have been listening about sort of what your next steps are or what next steps seem most important for your work. We have a, another quick pool here um, where we'd like to get a sense from you uh, and sort of ask you what next steps may, mean are most important for your work. Would it be some kind of coordinated monitoring network so we could really assess the systemic importance of um, living shorelines, perhaps research to improve design? Uh, information sharing with permitting agencies and training for practitioners or outreach to landowners. There's a lot of potential sort of aspects here that we've talked a little bit about. Probably give you just five more seconds here. So this is really interesting too. Um, really enjoyed sort of watching the pool results come in. Um, this, there's some real interest here among the sort of sharing with permitting agencies, which might be part of the reason why we have lots of government folks on the line today. Um, still seeing the need for improved designs and, and getting it out to practitioners and landowners. 
Um, and not to underplay at all, about a third of folks saying, look, uh, coordinated monitoring networks so we can really understand the impact is really important. Um, so I really appreciate that feedback. I want to encourage folks now, if you haven't had a chance yet, to enter your questions. Um, we're going to transition into a Q&A period. Um, we realize that there's a lot of expertise in the webinar today, and um, we've only scratched the surface for our participants' sharing experience and really elaborating on their ideas for next steps. Um, we want to help make connections and capture some of your ideas. So you'll see in the um, chat box or your console, there's a um, survey, a link to a, um, a survey that will allow you to uh, basically um, register yourself and to, to be sort of part of a follow-up group. Um, but before that, we'd like to invite you to um, ask your questions if you haven't typed your questions in. Uh, we're, what we're going to do is um, basically keep track of those questions, and I will um, ask some of the panelists. Um, we anticipate we won't be able to get to all of your questions, uh, and so we're hoping over the next couple of weeks or so, we can answer the ones that we don't get to. Um, and circulate those back through. So again, if you get a chance to click on that little survey and link there where you can add your name and your uh, contact information and any additional ideas you might have about next steps, um, that'll ensure that you get the document, follow-up questions, and also that your input gets incorporated. So I'm gonna start with a question here. Um, from Richard Peel, and uh, suggest maybe Jen, you might tackle this first. Um, so, do you find that local jurisdictions um, stream have a streamlining process, or could streamline living shoreline project permits uh, above traditional shoreline armor armoring? Let me take another stab at that. Um, I think the question is basically asking if local jurisdictions would sort of put a higher priority in permitting above traditional shoreline armoring. Right, okay, so I mean, I can speak to that for the state of Maryland. I, I mentioned we have um, the Living Shorelines Act of 2008, so for 11 years now, um, we have said, the state has said the preferred method is a, is a natural shoreline approach. So you really have to prove otherwise. Um, you know, you can still apply for a waiver, um, and that happens. Uh, uh, we do have a joint permit process uh, with the federal and state permitting. Um, I think uh, the timing sometimes can be a little bit lengthy, which can be a disincentive for homeowners. So they may, it may be faster to apply for the waiver and go for a hard, uh, um, armored shoreline than it would be to go through sort of the back and forth of, of designing the nuances of a living shoreline. So that's an area that I think that we can improve on to sort of be a little bit more um, speedier, and that would address some of those sort of those barriers to implementation at the local level as well. I hope I answered mm -hmm. um, Yeah, so it sounds like uh, the local jurisdiction doesn't necessarily stream, like sort of put a, a priority or have a role in prioritizing projects that's up to the landowner to apply to the state and work with the state and federal agencies for that. Yeah, I mean, we, we have some guidelines on our website that sort of got, go through the process. I mean, I, I will be honest, I'm not uh, an expert in the regulatory side of things, um, but I can certainly shoot you over to, if you just Google Maryland Living Shorelines and go to the DNR page, there's some FAQs that kind of from a homeowner's perspective, a contractor's perspective can take you through that process in the state of Maryland. Great. Okay, thank you. So we have a good pr uh, question here from Eric Roberts, um, who asks, um, and maybe Stuart, you can tackle this first, and then maybe Eric. Um, but so Eric, Eric Roberts asks, what do you see as the potential or likelihood for the development of design standards or performance standards for living shorelines in your state? Um, well, I can't speak for the state. I suspect anything like that is probably some distance down the road. Um, but it does relate back to the previous question as to whether 
there is some sort of fast tracking for um, living shorelines. And I have to tell you, I get a little concerned when I hear about some of this and that there's a risk, and I'm not saying anyone is doing this, but I'm saying there's a risk that if a certain um, you know, living shoreline design gets a fast track, then that's what everyone's going to do. And there's a chance that it won't be appropriate for certain situations. And then you run the risk of having folks say, well, look, we did it and it didn't work, so we're not going to consider these anymore. Um, and the other potential mm -hmm. problem is that you're just trading one kind of homogeneity for another. And given the, the range in all the attributes for natural shorelines along any coastline, the last thing you want to do is lose diversity because those natural shorelines have, have become different uh, for a, a whole variety of reasons. And to, to think that we're going to replace them with any single type of shoreline, be it you know, hard and gray or, or tremendously green, um, is probably mm -hmm. a bit uh, optimistic. So I, again, I think the issue is to have the knowledge base to, to say that for, for your site, for your degree of protection, for your conditions, here are the three best choices for you. And we're going to hope that one of those turns out to be one of these um, nature-based features. OK. Eric, how about you? What's the likelihood of some design or performance standard in Mississippi or Alabama? Um, yeah, that, that's a tough one. Um, I, I think every project is so different. Every shoreline is different. You know, everybody's neighbors are are different. So I think uh, a standardized approach may may not be the uh, the best thing for this. Um, so you know, we we just ran a, a contractor workshop a couple couple weeks ago or last week. I forget. Times times a blur now with a new baby. But we uh, we ran a contractor workshop and um, basically we just hit on the basics and, and suggested that they contact us after the fact that they have specific projects that they want to tackle because if we expanded that out to include every possible scenario we'd be there for a week you know and uh, the contractors didn't have time for that so uh, I, I I don't think it's likely that um, that there'll be a standardized type package of living shoreline activities push forward in our area. Yeah, I can see that. Um, Denise, I have a question uh, slightly sort of different tact here from Amanda Alva. Um, she says, I'm curious as to what line of evidence or data has been most effective in convincing policymakers or perhaps government agencies that living shorelines are worth funding and studying further. So is there a specific kind of evidence that has been helpful there? Well, as I mentioned, um, DNR has been implementing, as well as other agencies around the state, um, has been implementing these uh, oyster-based projects. And it really was the fact that, you know, that the communities were seeing how successful they were and how much marsh was filling in behind them and therefore protecting the shoreline. Um, that they really started asking um, our regulatory agency, how do I do this? Um, and, you know, how can this happen? And that elicited them coming to us and wanting to work with us. And so, you know, the, the beauty of the science collaborative funding source um, is the concept of actually, you know, developing um, research with management application and having there really be a true interaction and so it's been a it's been a wonderful uh funding source for us because we have that very direct connection um so I, you know I, I think it goes back to those pictures and you know getting the pilot studies and some of those things in place that really highlights the fact that they do function um and that they can be successful mm -hmm. that's great um I think we have time for one more question. I'm, I'm going to try and squeeze it in. It's for Christine. Um, it's from Lisa um, Spedafina, who wants to know um, how you balance the installation of a living shoreline. So you're putting something in the water, and yet we have these prohibitions on filling our waterways and impacting medic habitat. What, how do you sort of balance that? What happens there? 
Um, yeah, there's some value of, you know, potentially the, the benthic mudflat, you know, mudflat habitats that you're putting these structures in, um, into. And I think that, um, some of it's the objective of, of why you'd be putting it in in the first place. Is it meant to preserve the, the coastal wetlands that are behind it and that benthic habitat that you may have there? Was it salt marsh three years ago that's eroded and become benthic habitat? In which case you're, you know, you'd be implementing these structures for the purpose of restoration or at least preventing further habitat loss. And so I think you can justify, you know, in, in your, with yourself that your, that habitat that you're working in is, is actually an artifact of, of continued change. And, mm -hmm. um, but I think we should be a little bit careful about, you know, where we're putting these materials up. Are we managing against what's an, somewhat of a natural process um, in which that mudflat was going to expand, whether there was humans there or not, um, or are we, you know, we're engineering nature in all of these different situations and um, with living shorelines are hard, hard structures. And so um, I guess the, the, the question is, is, you know, thinking about what the main objective is of your project. Is it property protection? Is it, is it preventing further habitat loss? In which case I think you can justify putting the materials in to take over some of that benthic habitat. Um, however, if the ecological value is really high of that benthic habitat and you don't have these other sort of incidental ecosystem services generated by that living shoreline, then you may be doing sort of the natural system the biggest favor by leaving it alone. And so again, it's like, it's, there's so much squishiness about everybody's answers because it, you know, we always say it depends so much on the local context. And I think this is another example of that is, you know whether or not whether you make that decision to take over some of that that benthic habitat um i think depends on some of the conditions of that site and the site history um whether you're, you uh it, it, you whether you can justify it well and another reason why you can get a permit in one part and to do one thing and you can't do that same thing you can't get a permit to do it somewhere else these are some of the issues that permitting agencies need to take into account um, before they allow this to happen too. So, yeah, well, and, you know, we have a ton of great questions, but unfortunately we're sort of at the bottom of the hour. And I want to just remind folks that um, we will be circulating a Q&A document with the questions that you've submitted, which we haven't had a chance yet to address. Um, so keep your eyes peeled for those. Um, and I just want to wrap up here. Um, and thank you uh, for joining us. We really uh, appreciate your time and your interest. I want to thank the panelists for preparing and, and um, you know, being so articulate and being able to get a lot of information out in a very short period of time. Um, as you leave the monitoring, I'm so bummed. <laughs> I said, we have to do this again. I didn't get a chance to talk about long-term monitoring. <laughs> monitoring is really important. So we'll make sure it gets into the Q&A and it gets into the, the management brief for sure. Um, as we wrap up here, you guys, we'll all see a brief exit survey. It helps us a lot if you could take it. Um, in particular, we really welcome your ideas about next steps and potential synergies around the topic. Um, so keep your eyes peeled for the Q&A document, the updated management brief, and we'll be circulating those. Thank you again, all the participants, and a big thank you to our panelists. We hope you all have a great afternoon. Thank you.